Good afternoon and welcome to the event on the evolution of congressional internships. We're so excited to host this event uh, with our friends at the Capitol Hill Intern Association. My name is Taylor J. Swift. Yes, I promise my name is real. I'm the Deputy Director of Governance and Innovation at the PopVox Foundation. For those of you not familiar with our work, we work to help support the Hill in pursuing innovation and making government work better particularly with the focus on staff capacity, technology, and building bridges across silos. So I'm going to give a quick overview of how the next hour will go for this event. So I'm going to do some quick background on congressional internships, including their roles and responsibilities. Then we're going to do brief introductions from our panelists, and each of them will provide background and areas of their expertise as it relates to internships. And then we're going to have a big group discussion. We're going to pass through um, some, some questions to have a discussion, and then we'll have a final wrap up with some Q&A from the audience. So please, 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 if you have questions, please submit them over the chat and feel free to submit them anonymously uh, to a specific uh, speaker if you feel more comfortable. So um, with that, I'm going to get started. So congressional internships serve as the entry point for individuals seeking careers in politics and government. They can have a They've been a long fixture in congressional offices, providing invaluable pathways for young people to gain exposure in the legislative process and even considering careers in public service. I, like many of our panelists and audience members, have been an intern in Congress. So each year, roughly around 40,000 interns uh, help flock the halls of Congress, and they are pretty instrumental to help the institution run. While their um, roles and responsibilities have undergone significant transformation over the 20th century into the 21st century, we're excited to dive into that history and, of course, look forward to it as well. So today, these positions are very highly sought after and they play a critical role. Many interns are impressed with, uh, entrusted with a broad array of responsibilities from constituent services, responding to inquiries, assisting with casework, conducting legislative research, drafting talking points, attending hearings and meetings. And of course, many interns also serve as the eye and ears of congressional office, oftentimes answering phones, sitting at the front desk and guiding Capitol Hill tours. These um, uh, responsibilities offer interns a unique vantage point into the inner workings of the US legislative system, providing invaluable experiences that can shape their future careers and civic engagement. So initially, Internships in Congress were not very structured. They weren't as structured as the programs we see today. They were often informal arrangement where young individuals, you know, who were eager to participate in the legislative process would assist members of Congress almost directly in their variety of tasks, almost like full-time staff. Um, but they have evolved over time. And so with that, let's look at some of the history of congressional internships. So internships in Congress started roughly in the mid 30s, when the then nonprofit National Institute of Public Affairs would select roughly 30 students to move to Washington DC in 1935, where they would train the next generation of public servants. Then they formally emerged over the next few decades and becoming more widespread and systemic within the 1970s. So our first ex expert who will provide us with some historical background of congressional internships is the Honorable Jane L. Campbell. She is the fourth president and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society. And before joining the society in February of 2019, Ms. Campbell served as chief of staff for Senator Mary Landrieu of Louisiana and staff director for the U.S. Senate Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Ms. Campbell held elected offices as an Ohio State Legislature, Cuyahoga County Commissioner, and is the mayor of Cle uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and to date, the only woman to serve that position. Ms. Campbell has also run a small business, led the Washington office to a national community development organization, and led significant women's political advocacy groups. So with that, Jane, I'm going to hand the baton to you. Thanks. Well, thank you, Taylor Swift. Uh, it's an honor to be with you um, and also with you, Dr. Jones and Mr. Kramer. Uh, let me give you a quick interest, interesting background. I thought I understood the history of uh, internships in the Capitol until I had the interns that are working for us do some research, um, and I learned a lot of things. Um, officially, we didn't call uh, young people working for the Congress interns, uh, but young people working for the Congress dates back uh, to 1824. Um, at eight, in 1829, 
At the ripe old age of nine years old, Grafton Hansen was the first boy who officially carried the title of a Senate page. And the page program has a particular history that is really related to uh, students who were primarily high school age. Although that has evolved over time, of course, it started out as all boys. Eventually, they began to have girls. First, they thought it was uh, only for the white boys. Um, and there is actually a interesting history of the first congressional page who was African-American was during the initial area of reconstruction. Uh, even though we don't think about that being a time, but that was the first time. Then of course it took a long time till that got diversified, but that's a whole matter for another time. Um, in 1953, um, we had initially started congressional fellowships as a formal, uh, formal program. And in the Senate's annual report in 1959, they include a payroll that has six research interns. Doesn't speak to how many were there as volunteers, but there were six paid at that time. And in the 60s, congressional internships increased a lot, especially after John F. Kennedy gave his remarkable speeches about public service and ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Um, and the interns were usually college juniors or seniors. And in 1965, the House passed a resolution uh, which set aside a certain amount of funds for members to hire interns during the summer months. And in 1971, Virtually every house office offered paid internships, um, averaging about $300 a month, which would be equate to a salary of about $22,000 annually. Lawmakers decided to honor Lyndon Johnson in the wake of his death um, with the LBJ Congressional Internship Program. Um, and each office was given funds to pay interns $500 a month. That stipend, if you would just for inflation, would be $2,700 today on a monthly basis. And about 40% of the Senate offices paid their interns in 1974. If you look at the history of that, what happened is that in the 1980s, just under 80% of the Senate offices were paying their interns. But in 1992, presidential candidate Bill Clinton promised to cut the deficit and the White House staff. And so he imposed, together with Speaker Tom Foley, a 4% budget cuts. And the LBJ internship was one of the first things to go in the wake of those budget cuts. And that was really when we saw the pretty much the beginning of the end of paying congressional interns. The Congressional Accountability Act that was passed in 1995 codified the minimum wage and other labor protections for congressional staff, but specifically excluded interns so that interns had no, no such protection. And in 2017, and Guillermo will tell us about that, um, there was the nonprofit started Pay Our Interns, and that has been a continuing struggle as we move forward. More importantly, um, in, or maybe not more, but you know, in addition to that, the, the focus on who were interns has changed. Um, you know, there was a time where the first interns were children of Congress people, you know, that's, um, and then it was contributors, children of Congress people. So you had to be pretty well connected to get into the system. And that created a real diversity in terms of opportunities um, that were not meant to be um, part of our American dream, I would maintain. Um, in 1967, there were 1,500 congressional interns. Six were black 
and two were Hispanic. Doesn't hardly reflect the diversity of our, of our country. In 1973, the House PAGE program allowed the first female PAGE. Um, the other thing that happened is that as the internship programs were more and more recognized for what they could mean, not only to the country and to the workings of Congress, but to the people who were involved, um, there was a whole system of public interest groups that created programs to support interns. Um, in 1986, both the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute created internship programs that provided access and, and support for those paid internships, including housing. Because anyone who's ever been to Washington DC for more than a hot minute knows that it costs a, way too much to live in Washington DC. Um, and so that was a real um, investment in providing opportunity and diversity. In 2002, the American Association for People with Disabilities introduced a summer internship program mirroring that uh, the work of the Black Caucus and the Hispanic Caucus. Round about the same time, uh, Senator Mary Landrieu and the Congressional Caucus on Adoption created the Foster Youth Internship Program for children who were aging out of foster, foster care who would otherwise have no opportunity um, to come to Washington, to live in Washington. Um, and that program exists to this day. And those students are paired with offices that are interested in foster care policy. And all of a sudden they have someone in their office who actually has lived in foster care, which changes the world pretty dramatically in terms of how they do it. In 2009, uh, the American Veterans Congressional Internship Program was created. And in 2010, Representative Greg Harper created an internship program specifically for individuals with intellectual disabilities who only work for a couple of hours, but nevertheless diversify the offices. And in 2011, the Victory Institute institutes the Victory Congressional Internship Program, focusing on LBG, L, LBGTQ and uh, allied members of Congress. And so that, you know, you can see that as each of those entities has engaged, they've brought more people to the table. They've supported them, not only financially and with housing, but with a community of people to create access. Because for many people who are interested in public policy, would like to do an internship, they don't know how to approach it. They don't you know, have the contact with the members of Congress. They're not networked. Um, and so these organizations provide that. And finally, um, Taylor, you talked a little bit about the, the changing work of interns. I mean, if you look at when, you know, young people started coming to Congress, they, they were literally messengers. I mean, they, there weren't phones and faxes and Blackberries and internet and all this other kind of stuff. So it was like when you wanted a message from one member of Congress to another, you wrote something on a neat piece of paper, handed it to a kid and say, run that over to so-and-so. And when you carried a message from the House to the Senate, you carried a message, you actually carried. And so for a lot of the history of these young people working in Congress, they were literally message carriers. They were running documents back and forth. People had to sign everything themselves. We didn't have DocuSign and all this other magical stuff that we have now. Um, and gradually you saw um, when Taylor described the work of interns today, it is in many ways more substantive policy work than because the message carrying is done electronically. Um, but monitoring, there's also 
so many more entities to monitor, public interest entities, many more committees. Um, and so the interns become monitors for those kind of things. And so you look at what happens is that an opportunity to be an intern is an opportunity to learn a lot about the workings of government, but it's also an opportunity to create a network that's gonna build your career. So that's a quick summary of 250 years of history. Yeah, that's pretty insightful and, and, and pretty amazing, Jane. Thank you so much for giving that background and that extremely helpful context. It's so interesting to hear you know, at least when I was an intern and, and probably many of us on this panel, the perception up until a couple of years ago that internships have always been unpaid, right? I remember when I was on the Hill, it, it was always like, well, this is how it was generations ago. So this is how it's going to be. And it's it's so um, interesting to hear your um, your insights and and the knowledge that you just gave us on how actually that's not really the case that for for decades there was uh, quite a big infrastructure to help pay and support some of these interns albeit like you mentioned there were heavy gaps in accessibility and diversity but how that shifted um, in the early to mid nineties so. Um, to talk a little bit uh, about the recent advocacy push to help pay those interns um, is going to be our next expert here um, who helped co-found Pay Our Interns. Guillermo Creamer Jr. is the co-founder of Pay Our Interns, and he advocates for equitable workforce access, drawing from his experience as a former unpaid intern in D.C. Mayor Bowser's office and the House of Representatives. Based in Massachusetts with his husband and cat, he champions accessible pipelines for all individuals, irrespective of financial means, emphasizing the importance on fair intern compensation. His instrumental role in transitioning pair interns from a social media campaign to a thriving 501c3 organization reflects his commitment to fostering systemic change. He is the current interim executive director of pair interns. Guillermo, I'm going to pass it off to you. Awesome. Thanks so much for having us. Um, you know, I think what's what's really exciting is, you know, Jane, thanks so much for the historical context of all of this. Um, so as Taylor mentioned, I'm Guillermo. Uh, I co-founded the organization back in 2017, uh, truthfully, as a social media campaign. That's how we started. You know, we wanted to make sure that the voices of unpaid interns were being heard because the reality for us was, they weren't, you know, I think that we as former unpaid interns ourselves uh, wanted to ensure that this movement uh, was being pushed by those that understood the struggles that existed because of it. Um, you know, just some quick context from my end, I was an unpaid intern for both the DC mayor's office and for the House of Representatives, and I had to do a lot in order to offset those costs. Um, I was a live-in caregiver. Uh, in exchange for free rent. And I did babysitting gigs on the side. And then I would go to the Hill and that's how I would be able to manage, you know, working for free and having free housing and then figuring out some money on the side. Uh, and I think that that was really big for, for me and, and understanding that to me, I started Pay Our Interns with my counterpart because I didn't want my own sister to struggle in that in that sense. You know, it was a selfish reason why I started it, but obviously something that many of you can relate to. Um, you know, none of us should be working two or three jobs while attending school in order to 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 do an unpaid internship. And so when we started uh, the kind of the campaign call, it was to ensure that it wasn't about cutting young people a check. It was about creating an equitable workforce pipeline. Um, our internships, particularly in Congress, are the beginning of the pipeline for the congressional staff system and for those who may one day run to be members of Congress. And so to us, it was if that pipeline is inaccessible, then who is representing the people? And so we started in twenty in twenty eighteen, and we gathered. Um, we did old fashioned on the boots gathering of data as to who paid and who didn't. Um, and we released white pages as to you know which offices were paying, which offices weren't, and, and this data 
was it was hard to get because you had two young people. I think at the time we were probably 20 and 21 respectively, like we were very young. And so we were going office to office simply asking, hey, are you paying your interns or not? And and there was a lot of defensiveness to answering the question. You know, most people, first of all, didn't really want to answer the question outright. And so it was interesting to really see those offices that, that were very open about whether they paid or very not open about it. And so what was interesting to, to, you know, when the data did come together was finding out that Republicans were paying their interns almost twice as many of them than the Democrats were. And I think that that is a shock to many folks. Um, And, and our white pages was essentially weaponized um, by Fox news. And that's kind of how our movement really pushed because Fox News published an article that stated that 95% of Democrats that were supporting a $15 minimum wage bill had unpaid internships. And and that weaponization of a report that we truly just wanted to kind of move the needle with allowed us to really start seeing seismic change happen. And so suddenly we were reached out to and folks and, and members of Congress were like, well, what do we do? You know, and so it was interesting both Carlos and I at the time, again, being in our young 20s, were like, well, we, you know, we have to come up with a solution. And so we worked with both the House and the Senate um, to move a line item in, in the budget to start having money to pay interns. And so I think that that's something that was monumental. And, you know, we touched on the LBJ program and we knew about that, you know, and I think that what was interesting, Taylor, and you mentioned this, is most people would would say It's always been this way. And the answer was, no, it hasn't. You know, we had a paid internship program. If anything, I would argue the LBJ program was way more structured than what we have now, because unfortunately now we have 535 internship programs. We don't have one. And so, you know, my personal argument at that point is that I think things were a little bit more structured back then than they are now. But our advocacy efforts focus on making sure that there's money to pay interns but then we go a step further and make and I know that I know that Dr. Jones will touch on this, but who is getting paid? You know, we were both uh we're both Latino, we're both individuals from low-income backgrounds. And so to us, um, our voice mattered. And I think the way that we started doing our advocacy with specific members of Congress was talking about the fact that they should be reflect their office should reflect what their district looked like. And that included their internship pool. Um, And so, you know, we were very, very lucky that we were able to successfully pass the line item. And since since then, that line item has existed and if anything has grown, uh, which has been very helpful to the movement, but the movement still stands. Our organization's advocacy isn't over because the reality is, is that unpaid internships still exist. You know, there's still a legal avenue for them. And I think until uh, until Congress really has that frank conversation that unpaid internships shouldn't exist, um, that's when our advocacy efforts are over. But I think for now, um, our efforts are still very much needed. You know, I know that there are young people that are truly grateful for being paid now, uh, but there are still many, many young people, even those outside of Congress, that are still facing unpaid opportunities. And so... Um, so data was everything for our advocacy efforts. And I know that uh, Dr. Jones was helpful for us as well. We we partnered a couple times and so he'll touch on that. But, you know, the the work that we did was was not singular. You know, it wasn't just our organization. We worked with others in terms of making sure that our advocacy efforts were achievable. Yeah, that is so well said, Guillermo. And, and honestly, your story and Carlos's story is a testament to real life examples of how the institution and these programs have helped shape your uh, your work as a young leader, right? You having those perspectives of going in, working hard, feeling that that opportunity was not, you know, as easily given as some somebody else, like it should not be that way. Like the system should not have those inequities and those barriers of entry. And so it's a testament to your work. And to the work of of the groups that continue to try to push this conversation forward around not only 
pay, but transparency and accountability and to make sure that the institution is serving as many people as it can. And so with that, um, I want to introduce our, our finer ex expert and panelist. Um, for generations, you know, we just touched on this, Congress hasn't really published a ton of statistics on who does or doesn't pay interns. It's it's really up to those individual members to report their spending in their offices as a part of what are called statements of disbursements, which are released quarterly. Those are the accounts that uh, take into consideration everything from salaries for chiefs of staff and staff, but you know purchases for water and and operations and technology. All of those things are with, located within these state statements of disbursement. So gathering data, especially if an intern is unpaid, is extremely complex. It's a very, very, very high task because this isn't something that is centralized. It is completely decentralized. And so um, it's my privilege to introduce our, our final panelist on this who has done extensive work on examining the administration of the intern allowance once it was uh, installed several years ago. So Dr. James Jones is our, uh, currently a assistant professor of Africana Studies and Sociology and the inaugural director of the Center for Politics and Race in America at Rutgers University. Dr. Jones's research focuses on racial representation and inequity in the American political institutional systems. In his work, he studies the careers, work experiences, and activism of Black government workers, and he is the author of The Last Plantation, Racism and Resistance in the Halls of Congress, which is going to be released in May of 2024. I'm so excited for that book. So with that, I'm going to pass it to you, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Taylor. I am so excited to be here to sort of tell you what I know about congressional internships. Um, so I'll start with my own story, which is that I was a congressional intern, um, and it literally changed my life. Um, so in 2006, I was selected to be a congressional Black Caucus Foundation intern. Um, and as Jane mentioned, you know, this is a great program that has existed for decades um, that provides a pretty generous stipend um, and housing. Um, and, you know, from that internship, I had my internship extended. And so I ended up working on Congress for almost two years as an intern. Um, and I saw a lot. I saw the important role of congressional staffers. Um, I also saw how this, um, you know, Capitol Hill was not a really diverse and inclusive workplace. Um, so it led me to become a researcher um, uh, and to study this problem as a sociologist. Um, one of the things I like to emphasize when we're talking about congressional internships um, and why they matter, um, and importantly, you know, it helps to train the next generation of public uh, service leaders, whether they're staffers or even members of Congress, but it also matters much more broadly for our democracy that ordinary people have uh, access to this institution. Um, and it can, you know, this will be a lesson that stays with you for the rest of your, your lifetime, but it can shape your career um, in unexpected ways, right? Um, so I thought I would be a congressional staffer. <laughs> that was not in the cards for me, but I ended up studying congressional staffers, right? And this is all because of an internship. So I want to tell you what I know um, about congressional internships, and I've been studying congressional internships in particular for about the last decade. Um, again, this was a natural interest uh, for me, given my research. Um, I'll caveat this by sort of highlighting that, you know, much of what I'm about to say is available in both um, some policy papers that I've done with uh, Pay Our Interns, um, and they are available both on the Pay Our Interns website and also my personal website. Um, and a little bit of this is covered in my book, which will be out um, in May, The Last Plantation from Princeton University Press. Um, so I want to sort of pick up with Guillermo left off. It's in 2017, we see that members of Congress, uh, in large part, thanks to Guillermo and to Carlos um, at Pair Interns, they create this pool of, of money to fund internships on Capitol Hill. So we wanted to see what happened when Congress started paying their interns. Um, so we released a policy report uh, in 2021, I believe. Um, it's called Who Congress Pays. Um, and it really is this um, eye-opening account to how congressional offices are managing their money, particularly as it relates to internship allowances and who gets to work on Capitol Hill. Um, I think one thing that we can all agree on here is that Congress is not the most transparent employer. Um, so a lot of the, uh, 
you know, basic questions about who works on Capitol Hill, how do interns work, it's it's buried um, and a lot of different um, historical, uh, you know, materials, as Taylor mentioned, these sort of um, disbursement records, which for a long period were printed, now they're PDFs. Uh, but if you're doing a large study like we are, it becomes really, really hard to quantify um, or to examine this quantitatively. Um, so what we did was we looked at the first year of the congressional internship program with this new allowance. Um, so we combed through about 8,000 pages of these disbursement records, and we looked up records for about 3,500 students who interned in Congress between May and September, which again is kind of like this high season, the summer when, you know, the uh, hallways of Capitol Hill really just swell with interns. Um, and so we looked at um, people's names, um, how much they were getting paid. We also did some, um, you know, ex more extensive research to sort of look at where they were going to school and also to find pictures to sort of think about their racial identity. Um, again, um, I would point out in other workplaces, these types of data are readily available and oftentimes they are mandated by law to you know, report important demographic information because of Congress. However, Congress has exempted itself from these reporting requirements. So it becomes really hard to know how the congressional workplace operates and if it's um, you know, one that is really reflective of the country. So what did we find? We found that white students were dramatically overrepresented in paid internship positions and that black and Latino students were underrepresented in these same paid positions. Um, so overall, and for the summer of 2019, we found that 26% of paid interns through this new program were white, 6% were black, uh, or 7% were black, 8% were Latino, 8% were um, Asian American. Um, and these numbers are quite jarring. So if I if you were to put this into context to um, the national undergraduate population, which is um, in many ways, the same as the intern pool. It's slightly different because um, oftentimes interns can, you know, graduate or they're coming to intern, you know, years after um, they've graduated college because this is the only way to get onto Capitol Hill is through an internship. Um, so if I can sort of compare the national undergraduate student population to who Congress paid, we see how jarring um, uh, these these practices are. So for instance, White students made up about 52% of the national undergraduate student population, but accounted for, again, 76% of paid interns. And Black and Latino students make up about 15 and 20% of the undergraduate student population, but accounted for about, again, 7 and 8% of paid interns. Um, we also found that um, interns are coming, uh, who are being paid out of this allowance, were coming overwhelmingly from private universities, right? Um, over 50% of paid interns were enrolled at uh, private universities. Um, and again, we're put this into comparison, about 25% of students, um, undergraduate students nationwide, um, only attend um, uh, private universities. So again, uh, we see students that are, um, uh, really unrepresentative of, of you know, students nationwide, right? Both in terms of race, but also in terms of class when we are thinking about the types of institutions that um, are represented on Congress. Um, it's institutions like, you know, Princeton and Harvard um, who are oftentimes supplementing the money that they get um, uh, from Congress to make this uh, a program that is actually worthwhile and that students can actually afford to do. Um, we found that Congress simply wasn't paying enough. Um, on average in the House, the stipend was about $1,600. Um, and then the Senate it was about $1,900. Um, and it's simply not enough to pay the bills, uh, to borrow a line from pay our interns. Um, you know, when I interned in Congress in 20, uh, 2006, my intern stipend was $2,500. Um, and it's crazy um, that 15 years later, that the average for both the House and Senate is less than that, especially when we consider the rate of inflation and that Washington, D.C. represents um, the sixth most expensive city in the United States. 
Um, so I want to give just a few more statistics about why this is important. Um, again, we know that these internships are crucial to getting a job on the Hill. Um, oftentimes, uh, or one uh, one study showed that over 50% of congressional staffers got their start via an internship. Um, and about one six, you know, give or take in each Congress uh, of lawmakers have actually been either a former staffer or a former intern. Um, these internships are important because, you know, you participate in a lot of stuff in legislative activities. Uh, but it's, in, again, important to remind, uh, um, keep in mind uh, the structure of the congressional workplace. It is highly decentralized and not formalized. So the reason why internships are so important and they are a pathway to uh, paid employment is because there isn't a strong foundation to teach new workers um, how to do the job. So you start as an intern. Um, but if this is not accessible, it becomes almost impossible to get a job on Capitol Hill because of the way in which the congressional workplace is so insular. So I'll stop there and uh, we can give it over to you, Taylor, for other questions. Yeah, Dr. Jones, that was super insightful. For those who haven't been able to, to read those reports, they're absolutely fantastic. I know they're they're on POI's website and Dr. Jones's website Um very, very helpful to to put into context those points in time of where the institution was paying um, and and where those you know difficulties remain. So um, I know Guillermo touched on it a few minutes ago, but um, there was the big push several years ago to include um, paid funding um, for the House and the Senate. But unfortunately, it just the the fund wasn't that large. On average, the first initial fund gave each office around twenty thousand dollars. Um, it's just not enough to to have a steady stream of paid internships, especially with that high cost of living. And so uh, since fiscal year 2019, all the way up until fiscal year 2023, the last appropriations bill that uh, has passed and, and been signed into law, that number per individual office on the House side has gone up to $46,800, which is better, um, but it still isn't to the degree in which it needs to be in order to have someone come in, be able to pay for that high cost of living. Um, and of course, like we continue to talk about, it is very decentralized. Um, it's very hard for um, the institution to know which office is using all of their funds, which offices isn't using their funds. If interns that are there at the same time are being paid the same, it's just, it's it's very difficult to, to kind of shine a light on those things. And so there was actually a conversation that Carlos, um, the other co-founder of Pair Interns, uh, took part in, and I believe Dr. Jones, you testified as well, before the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, the 117th ModCom, had a hearing about uh, pathways to congressional service. And one of the things they discussed at length was congressional internship opportunities. That hearing helped take away some of these issues. And with that, that uh, select committee actually recommended creating a House Intern Resource Office, um, something that was also included in the fiscal year 2023 bill. There was about $350,000 uh, to create that office. It is going to be a central office within the House of Representatives to help um, track more of this data um, at the institutional level. And then, of course, um, have best practices for for onboarding for interns and, of course, best practices for intern coordinators, which, um, as we all know, and, and people on this call, internships vary widely per office. You could have an ex extremely different experience in one office compared to the other. So having a central office like this will be pretty instrumental to help recruit and to help professionalize a lot of those folks that will be coming through uh, Congress. Unfortunately, there still isn't an office like this in the Senate. So something to to be aware of and something that probably needs to be better parity on is as the House stands up an office like this to, to help the institution from the inside and to help staff and, of course, the perspective and current interns, the Senate needs to look to create to something like this as well. Um, I'm going to open it up to uh, some, some questions for our panelists, but of course, those that are attending, please drop any of your questions, either about your internship in particular or Congress as an institution and their internships. Please drop that in the chat and we'd be happy to spend the last couple of minutes answering some of those questions. But the first question I'm going to be uh, asking to you, Guillermo, so I just mentioned how 
Um, the House is finally, you know, they increased some of that funding to around $46,800 per personal office. But talk to us a little bit about the differences between personal office internships, committee office internships, leadership internships. Are there discrepancies in pay? Are there still outstanding issues um, in either chamber on, on who's paid where? Uh, love to hear some of your thoughts on that and what your org is doing. Yeah. So um, I think for starters, you know, and, and you mentioned this, you know, it's important to note that the numbers have gone up. And I think that that's really, really important. Uh, when the first numbers were being proposed, it was a very quick, like, small, minimal number to every House office, minimal number to every Senate office, like, let's get the ball rolling. Um, I will say, like, the way that things worked with both the House and the Senate appropriation conversations the first time around it was so rapid that I think it was just one of those things where it caught everyone off guard and it was just like, we need to do this. Let's just do it. Um, I, you know, and that's not to say it wasn't done well, but it just was done in a manner that it was like, let's just get this in the books. Um, and I think that, you know, that worked to start. Um, but it became clear over the years, you know, it took some it took some advocacy efforts, but it happened where committees started getting funding as well for their internship programs. Leadership now has their own budget for internship programs. And so the question now is, you know, what is an equitable internship program? I think that that's the question that a lot of a lot of these line items need to start asking themselves because when you're looking at CHCI and you're looking at CBC, like you're looking at these programs that not only, you know, give a stipend or pay their interns, but they also provide housing, you know, and so we don't, we don't have that luxury at the moment in Congress where, you know, they're offering housing for interns. Um, and so our advocacy efforts right now stem on ensuring that that number always goes up and never down. Um, but something that we do as an organization as well is, you know, when offices reach out to us and say, you know, what is an equitable number? Uh, we do work with them with that. You know, we tell them like this, if you're going to approach the stipend approach, this is what it should look like. If you're going to look at the hourly approach, this is what it should look like. And the reality is, is that some offices then start to understand, well, we don't have enough money. And so I think that, I think the reality here is that, and, and this is again, a personal opinion, but I, I think until we elect a member of Congress who came from the paid internship pipeline, we're not going to have a true, a true star that will push this effort to the maximum. You know, I think that we have some true champions in both the House and the Senate that have done great work and that have been very strong advocates for the internship movement. But I think that my hope is that in the next two to three cycles, we'll start to see an individual that did come through the paid internship opportunity that will then say, well, if it wasn't for this program, I wouldn't be here. And I think that that person will champion the way that internships will then be perceived in Congress. You know, I think a lot of our success as an advocacy organization has been behind the power of storytelling. And, and so I think until someone is telling that story in a position of power, we're not going to see that full flux. Now, that doesn't mean our organization isn't doing all, it's, all it can. You know, we obviously are meeting with both the House and the Senate to ensure that that line item exists, to ensure that it never gets taken off and that it always increases, you know, because we, we always argue too, like, what about district offices? You know, like the argument there is that those are interns that are home, you know, they're in your home district. And so, in my opinion, those are just, if not more important, particularly during the school year, you know, and so there's so many approaches that I think, and this again goes to the argument that there's 535 different internship programs on Capitol Hill. And I think that that does a little bit of a disservice because offices do have the luxury of kind of deciding how it's going, how it's going to go down for them. Um, but the last reminder that we give to every single office is you got to use your money because if you don't use it, it just goes away. And so, you know, it's not like it rolls over. It's not like, so it, you offices have to use their money. And so we, as an, as an advocacy organization are there um, to ensure that offices know how to do it in an equitable manner. Absolutely. And, you know, anecdotally, when I, have spoken with several offices who are administering this paid internship fund. I've heard a variety of different answers when it comes to how much are you paying your DC interns compared to how much are you paying your district interns. Some of them, they're paying the exact same rate, even if 
in the district, the you know the cost of living is lower. They just have a, a more standardized process. Whereas some offices, they kind of use the more local-ish minimum wage and kind of use the DC minimum wage to achieve more um, location parity, one would say. And so it's very interesting that there is a little more agency, but at, at the same time, you know, we, we've been talking at length about the the lack of transparency about some of these budgets, especially as Dr. Jones mentioned, how difficult it is to, to cultivate and analyze this kind of data. Taylor, if I could just add one thing, you know, so I've been thinking about what does it cost to, what is an appropriate number? Um, and so uh, with the Center for Politics and Race um, at Rutgers in Newark, um, we are launching a Capitol um, Hill internship program this summer with Braven. Um, which helps to, uh, as an organization that helps to uh, make sure that, you know, first generation students of color, um, you know, they can get the sort of a high return investment on um, their college degree by getting a good job. Um, so, you know, I've been literally in the weeds thinking about this budget. Um, and for us, it really costs about $10,000 each student um, to bring someone to DC, right? So, we are paying for their housing. That's about $3,500 for two months. Uh, we're giving them a $6,000 stipend for two months. Um, and, you know, we're going to give them a, tra a traveling allowance. We're giving them money to buy clothes to work on Capitol Hill because you need professional attire. Um, so it really roughly comes out to $10,000. And if we're looking at the budgets that we, House office and Senate office is given, they don't have enough. Um, and so I think overall, I think we can sort of see that many different internships are just not offering a, what is a realistic stipend, right, um, for uh, students. Uh, students. Um, and But I think, you know, it matters. I think one of the things that we have to do, um, particularly for those outside of Congress, is talk about the value of these internships, right? Um, and it is a crucial effort for our democracy. It is essential, right? Um, and, it, and again, it it's it means more. Um, it's more than just like diversifying who works on Capitol Hill. It's about having ordinary citizens have an experience with Congress. Um, because oftentimes we were so jaded. Um, and I remember, you know, one of the things that I, you know, got from my internship was that people in my family started looking at me differently. It's like, oh, what's happening there? Oh, they actually are doing work? Oh, this is not what I've been reading on the news or seeing on the news, right? Um, so it matters for our democracy that we have this sort of strong and vibrant uh, program where we can bring everyone across from across the country into the halls of Congress. Extremely, extremely well said. Um, I often thought, you know, when I had my internship opportunities, it, like you, Dr. Jones, kind of solidified in one way or another, like, is this career right for me? But I also think that there's so much value in those who can participate in this process and can become congressional interns. And they may find out that an internship uh, in public service and public service more broadly isn't for them. But that being said, it should be a valuable experience where when they're leaving, because they had pay, because they had these reduced barriers to entries, that they can speak fondly of that experience to their family and to their friends and have more faith in the institution, even if that's a career they do not decide to go down. So I completely love that thought and you're you're exactly right. Um, I'm gonna switch gears really quickly before we open it up to q and I'm gonna ask one more question to our panelists and then go to the, the general Q&A. So this one, Jane, I'm gonna um, aim at you. So how has, you know, recently, COVID-19, how has that impacted congressional internships? I know that the House and Senate went to virtual for a little while. I, I would love for you to speak on that for a little bit. And then how has, you know, the changing dynamic of, of social media and some of those e-signature platforms, how has that changed the roles and responsibilities of internships over the last several years compared to what it was uh, in years and decades prior? Oh, Jane, you're still muted. You'd think I would learn, you know, um, the, I think COVID was very, very hard on the internship programs because a virtual internship does not provide the camaraderie, which is so critical to the internship experience. It doesn't have, provide the opportunity to 
meet with people from different places, from different areas and different backgrounds and uh, look at the lively debate that it takes to create public policy. Um, I think COVID hurt the public policy process writ large, not just the internship program. Um, one of the fascinating things for us as the Capital Historical Society, we think of ourselves as a Hill adjacent group. Um, we work with the Hill, we're close to the Hill, um, but we're not directly on the Hill. Um, we were able to open our in-person internship program more quickly than Congress itself. And when we did, we had enormous interest uh, from the intern community because people just didn't, you know, it just, it just wasn't the same to have a virtual internship where they could come into our office and, you know, we had a big enough space that we could do the social distancing and all that jazz. Um, and so we had a lot more uh, engagement. I think where we look at the technology question is that now our interns to us, at least in our place, our interns are more tech savvy than some of our staff, particularly me. Um, you know, I sort of say like, look, y'all are digital natives. And I mean, look at this background here. I will reveal to you, I would have no clue how to create a background like that, much less figure out how, and it was one of our interns that said, why don't we all have a, the same background? She created it, she sat down, showed me how to use it. And so I think there are opportunities, we, we think about technology as creating distance. And I think to a certain extent, technology reminds us that the next generation knows things we don't know. And it is very valuable in that way, if you let it be. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to, to that point about um, becoming a lot more tech savvy and social media savvy, um, even when I was a congressional intern um, almost a decade ago, I would say 50 to 70% of my day was spent gathering signatures on bills and resolutions, just literally running around the house, just gathering those signatures in person because there wasn't the e-signature software available to do it digitally. And it was an amazing experience because I could tour the buildings, I could you know, meet other interns in other offices. But as we're shifting to more digital based software for you know Quill and a lot of these other signature platforms, a lot of those responsibilities are, are kind of uh, shifting to other issues, organizing and responding to mass mailers and digital and media and things like that. And so that role will continue to change over time. And so it, it'll be so interesting to see as as Congress, you know, adopts AI and other large language models and other things within their operations, what the role of internships will look like as well. Um, so I, I completely agree. Um, I'm going to open it up to some of these questions we're getting in the chat. So I'm going to open it up to anyone on the panel to answer this one. Is there a gold standard elsewhere in government or the private sector against which internships, pay, and benefits should be measured? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there's an exact science out there. I think the reality is, is that, um, you know, you look at different programs that exist, for example, in the corporate world, um, you know, the major corporations, they understand the benefits of paying interns. Uh, most, if you, you know, if you're looking at big law, you're looking at big corporations and all those stuff, they pay their interns a hefty salary and they do it because they're enticing these folks to then work for them. You know, they see the purpose of it being a gateway to really starting your career path that they're having with them. Um, and so I think, you know, I think obviously we, the public sector doesn't have the money that the private sector does, but the argument should still stand that if you want 
to diversify your current pool of staff. You know, if you want to start by paying your interns. Um, and, and my argument extends beyond Congress. You know, look at there are 50 different legislatures throughout the country. Um, that It's the same argument there. You know, if you want to diversify the staff at your state legislature level, um, you should be looking at your internship opportunities because every single office has one. Um, and so the argument to, you know, for me is that um, make sure that your program allows for diversity and, and and diversity is not just race. It's not just, you know, it's a variety of it. It's, it's ensuring that people from low income backgrounds can really take on opportunities. It's about ensuring that your public school kids can take on these opportunities. You know, Dr. Jones talked about this. A lot of paid interns now still come from private institutions. And one of the things that we did at POI was really push for community colleges and state schools to know that this funding existed because they did it. Um, and so, you know, th there's so much that can be done. I don't necessarily think that there's a gold standard, but I do think that um, you, you give out what you get. And I think that that's the best way to look at it. You know, if we want to get the best, we should be putting out the best. Yeah, uh, extremely well said. I'm going to answer one or ask one more audience question. So are there any concerns with certain kinds of outside entities, either in sponsoring internships or how they recommend particular individuals for internships? Uh, Dr. Jones, I'm going to go to you for this one. Um, so I think perhaps there are some concerns, right? I'm going through the middle uh, or I'm in the process of selecting interns and it's been a very long and arduous process to vet them. Um, and I would hope that other entities would, you know, dedicate the same time and you know, resources to making sure that they are selecting great students um, and that this is about students and not their own, um, you know, interest. Um, and so, I had I could I could see how this could be a, become a problem. Um, I think one thing I want to sort of follow up with Guillermo, but like this overall conversation is that um, we're talking about what we know about congressional internships, um, but we also overall just don't know a lot. Um, no one studies congressional interns. This is not a focus of political science. Um, I was like one of the only researchers to sort of focus on congressional interns to walk the hills to try and like map this problem out. Um, it's not thought of as an important problem, nor is even congressional staffers, right? Um, and the diversity or lack thereof there. Um, but this comes to a bigger problem, which I think we sort of see both in Congress, but also within the public discourse, but is that we see Congress as a political institution um, and, as, and we rarely see it as a workplace. Um, and this is particularly a problem for members of Congress because they are so overwhelmed that they don't have the energy or the time to properly manage the congressional workplace. Um, and the reason why these outside entities are doing, you know, are particularly helpful uh, is because they're doing a lot of work for, that staffers can't do, which is to select interns, right? Um, the intern coordinator is probably the staff assistant or junior staffer who's already overworked. Um, so I think what we need to have is a large and robust conversation nationwide about reforming, you know, Congress, expanding it. Um, and I think, you know, you know, Popbox has been, you know, leading in this conversation about how do we, you know, um, reform the first branch of government. But I think this can also be done with, you know, efforts to diversify um, um, the workforce as well to grow it. Uh, so, you know, I think I have some, you know, I can imagine that there are some concerns here, um, but I think the bigger concern is that there is just no oversight, there's no transparency, transparency about how congressional internships are still being managed, how how pay is being doled out, um, and that there this, this problem still needs to be elevated within the public discourse. Absolutely. Um, extremely well said. I know we're at time, but I'm going to give each of you about 60 seconds for one final question before we break. So um, I'm going to start with Jane and then go to Guillermo and then we'll we'll end with Dr. Jones. Can each of you give me one thing that Congress can do as an institution to improve congressional internships? I'm, I'm going to pick up on what Dr. Jones just was talking about in terms of transparency, that if 
if the office, if every office had to have a standard report about who their interns were, what they were paid and where they came from, including who came uh, supported by, whether it's the Black Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, foster youth, you know, there are a number of special interest groups that are beginning to pay, pay for interns. And all of a sudden you've got someone in your office who has an agenda, which every congressional office has an agenda. But as long as we're transparent about what that is, it makes a difference. Um, so I think that, you know, for us, it's about ensuring that this conversation doesn't end. You know, I think the reality here is that when when we were able to push money through the appropriations, um, there were some folks that looked at us and said, OK, great, like your mission is accomplished. And, and the answer is it's not. You know, I think that we're grateful for the efforts that have been made over the last several years. But the reality is, is that intern advocacy is is still very much needed you know i think that for example the house you know the house office that has been created is a step in the right direction but i don't think it's the solution you know i think that congress does this thing where they'll say let's start an office for it and and again if there isn't enough accountability or if there isn't enough work behind it you don't necessarily get the successful outcome that you want uh, and so I I fear that. And so my hope is that um, the advocacy efforts that we put in are still very much at the forefront of congressional mindsets. And also the understanding that internships are actually vital to, to the pipeline that exists in Congress. You know, it's not just about cutting young people a check. It's about really ensuring that the workplace there is diverse, is reflective of the American people. Um, and so our advocacy isn't over. And I think that offices should continue to expect to hear from us um, and, you know, make sure that offices are excited to hear from us because we're not going anywhere. Um, I would say that Congress needs a good PR campaign um, that, you know, reaches out broadly to students, you know, really tell them why it's important to intern, to intern on Capitol Hill and all the different benefits you can get from, you know, this one and like really lifetime experience. Um, just sort of pick up with Guillermo said a few moments ago, um, you know, um, in the corporate sector, uh, different corporations spend a considerable amount of money to pay their interns and to recruit them. Um, again, they see themselves as a workplace, right? And so they're trying to get the best talent. And, you know, as a sociologist, I'll say, um, that doesn't necessarily mean getting the best talent. It also means oftentimes getting the most privileged people, um, but they're spending resources. Um, Congress doesn't do that. I mean, again, they see themselves as an employer second to as a, you know, being the legislature. Um, but it also is to say that Congress doesn't advertise. It, it kind of sees itself as a seller's market and it relies so heavily on the allure of working on Congress that you get the sort of stable crop of people who've always wanted to end, be interned into uh, intern in Congress. It's the political science student. Um, but I think they need to sort of draw and or actually do some type of outreach to different groups and um, bring different people um, into Congress. So it could be, you know, people who study the humanities. Um, um, engineers, um, people who have health backgrounds, right? They should come into Congress as well, right? And so this is just not about, you know, diversity, but it's also about um, how do we get innovation into Congress, right? And this requires Congress to actually do some type of outreach to say, hey, come work for us. We're, you know, it's a great place. And I think it is. Yeah, all three of those answers, um, extremely multidimensional, great, uh, what we've learned here today is that there isn't a magic wand. There isn't one thing in this space that will cure all of these systemic issues. Rather, it's continuing the conversation, continuing the confluence of recommendations and resources, and to continue to make sure that the institution can make itself better. And, and this is one thing that is going to be pretty, pretty instrumental in the success of the congressional pipeline as a workplace. So thank you so much for, for everybody to take the time to, to watch today. And thank you so much to all of our amazing panelists. We have Dr. James Jones, the Honorable Jane Campbell, and of course, Guillermo Creamer Jr. 
We'll be posting this event on the PopVox Foundation website at popvox.org in the coming week or so. We'd love any feedback, so please reach out to me at taylor at popvox.org. Um, so thank you so much, and please let us know how we can be as supportive as we can. So thanks so much. Have a great day, everybody.